Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes, God. We're going to get to it. I just felt something on that. Turn with me to Romans chapter 1, verse 16. Now, if y'all would have cut up with me, we would have been out of here a lot faster. Y'all didn't want to cut up, so. Am I good, Miss Virginia? I'm okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. I think I'm going to sit here on these discourses regarding the different New Testament churches. We started something a few weeks ago about follow the leader part one and, and follow the leader part two. The Lord allowed us to land on the Philippians and their church. So I'm going to deal with the Romans and their church. And I'll deal with some other churches because we need to get right as the church. Romans 1, 16, Paul says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. For the Jew first and also the Greek. I want to take my thought from the first part of the verse where it says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Uh, look at somebody uh, like you agitated. And tell them, you are bold-faced Believer, <laughs> you're a bold faced believer, is what I want to talk about. Where my graphic at is today. Oh, there it is. You're a bold faced believer. Y'all, some of y'all done told folk that before. You're a bold faced lie, is what you told them. But you're a bold faced believer. Father God, I thank you today for your word and what you want to share and how you want to shift us. We pray, Father God, that what you want to say is said and that you sit me down and you increase yourself and you stand up in me. We pray, Father, that the word is communicated appropriately and that someone's life will be changed. In Jesus' name, amen. I can remember one time I was at work and um, I had a manager that didn't really like me. Well, I don't know if she didn't like me or she just had some other things going on with her, but she said something that I did something. sat in her office and I looked her in her face with all boldness and all sagacity and I said you a bold faced liar needless to say I cleared my desk all my things in a target band and left. I 
Romans. I was thinking about Paul's words here in Romans 1 and 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It occurred to me that to be unashamed isn't something that one does quietly. To be unashamed means that you're living your life out loud with boldness. It means that what you have anchored yourself to requires levels of volume that makes it impossible to be unnoticed. As I sat in my manager's office and called her a bold-faced lie, uh, the entire office heard it. Uh, because when you're bold, when you're unashamed, the volume that comes with that is impossible for you to go unnoticed. And so visibility is inextricably linked to being unashamed. But notice that Paul isn't just unashamed. He is unashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I just told y'all what I did to my manager. I, I need y'all to understand that I was in my 20s at the time. Yeah, you get a little bit grace when you're in your 20s. I wasn't 40 something doing that. I, uh, even though she lied, you know, I, I have better tactful ways of uh, telling the folk you a lie, you know. Uh, but, but I was in my 20s at the time. But, 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 but Paul, when he's unashamed, he, he points out that he is unashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and what we learn from this is uh, we can't just be unashamed. Some things we should be ashamed of. And now that I look back over my life, and I'm going to be 48 in a few weeks, uh, I look back over the 20 years later, and I begin to realize that what I'm ashamed of in calling her a bold-faced lie is that I allowed her to bring the worst out of me. Mm. Uh, sometimes you need to be a little ashamed. <laughs> because you allowed something to bring the worst out of you. You allowed something to push you to a point uh, of no return. You allowed something to get under your skin to the degree that now you're acting out of character. And so what I've learned over the past 20 years now uh, since that incident is that you have got to learn how to be, uh, uh, not allow yourself to allow people to get to you to the point where you act out of character and do things that you wouldn't normally do because of how they're acting. Let the bad behavior be on them. Let the disappointment be at their feet. Let them act out. I'm, if next time somebody accuse me of something, I'm just going to laugh. He, 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 for real? You think I did that? Okay. The next time you uh, somebody come at me in a way that I don't really like it, I'm just going, okay, all right. That's how you feel about it. I'm going to live after this because I'm not going to allow you to put Push me to the point where I have to deal with the shame that comes with the boldness in a moment that wasn't anchored to Jesus Christ. And some things we should be ashamed of. And what we learn in Galatians chapter 5 is we speak a lot about the fruit of the spirit, but very little about the works of the flesh. Uh, do you realize that our flesh will have us doing some things that if we're not careful, we'll feel unashamed about something that we should be ashamed of? Mm. Uh, when you become unashamed of the works of the flesh, you soon find yourself filled with pride, arrogance, and haughtiness. An unashamed adulterer becomes a serial adulterer. 
An unashamed, contentious person becomes contentious in everything they do. An unashamed, lewd person becomes oblivious to their surroundings. Sometimes shame is needed to keep us from going too far out of bounds. Uh, sometimes shame is needed to keep us from looking too crazy in public. Sometimes shame is needed to keep what's coming out of our mouth to keep us from being a person that allows anything that comes out of your mouth. Oh God, oh God, sometimes shame is needed so that we will be mindful of if I do this, I'm going to shame my family. If I do this, I'm going to shame my family's name. If I do this, I'm going to shame everybody who ever believed in me, everybody who ever invested in me, everybody who ever stood with me, everybody who ever said I'm praying for you, everybody who ever said I know you can do it, everybody who ever said I, I'm just going to stand with you through this, if I do this something should remind me man I don't want to do this because if I do this it's going to take the lid off of everything that God has put under me here and I need you to understand ladies and gentlemen that there comes a point in your life that you have to be ashamed of something in order to know what you should be unashamed about so then it's one thing to be unashamed but it's a whole different thing to be unashamed of the right thing and what Paul communicates here is what we are unashamed of can't be of ourselves he was unashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ and he put the onus of his lack of shame where it should be on Jesus and not on himself. Jesus is the one responsible for the privilege of being unashamed. Don't you ever think that you're responsible for your being unashamed? I, I, see, you got to understand, ladies and gentlemen, that the, the, the text says in Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, that by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. If you are able to do it for yourself, you can boast and say, I did it. I saved myself from sin. I saved myself from embarrassment. I saved myself from shame. Look at how awesome I am. Look at how phenomenal I am. Look at all the things that I've done to keep myself out of trouble. Look at all the things that I've done to keep myself from embarrassment. Look at all the things that I've done to keep myself from messing my life up. No, baby, it was God. Woo! God kept you from messing your life up. God kept you from making that mistake. God kept you from doing the thing that could have ruined your reputation. God kept you out of the back of that car. God kept you out from giving your phone number to the wrong person. God moved that bullet away from you. Oh God, when the enemy tried to kill you, it was God who sent his angels to encamp around you and to protect you. Oh my God, God did it. It ain't in me, it's in him that we live, that we move, and that we have our being. And so anything that puts the onus on us is too much for us to carry. And I'm too iffy to be unashamed of anything I do. I, I'm too up and down to be unashamed of anything I do. I'm too unpredictable to be unashamed of anything I do. I might feel right in one moment and feel, the, oh my God, another way in the next. This is why you can't read your own press clippings because sometimes the headline will say you wonderful and the next time the headline will say, boy, you a mess. Oh God, sometimes the headline, the ticker will say, oh man, she came out of that. The next time it'll say, man, that girl is totally up from the flow up you can't read your own press clip
clippings. You've got to learn how to say it's in God. Ah, he's the one who's stirring me. He's the one who's kept me. He's the one who's bringing me out. Oh, my auntie, I wish my Aunt Ella was still around. My auntie used to sing a song from the Mississippi Mass Choir. She used to say, God is keeping me. Yeah. Ah, God. God is keeping me. You got to understand that it ain't because of you that you're here. It's because of his grace. It's because of his mercy. It's because of his unmerited favor that I'm able to stand here today and let it be known and let it be heard that it was God who brought me out. Ah, oh, God. And so what you have to understand, ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, brothers and sisters, is uh, uh, th there's just way too much mm, uh, God put on us for us to live loudly wrong. Ooh, can I tell you that? You can live loud if you want to, but you can live loud and still be wrong. Oh, God. Tell somebody they loud and wrong. They loud and wrong. And they unashamed about their loudness they unashamed about their wrongness I don't want to be loud and wrong if I'm gonna be loud man let me be right ah, I feel the Holy Ghost up in here for some reason I don't even know why I'm preaching like this I ain't got no business preaching like this God said oh God I'm gonna put the word in you I'm gonna give you what to say remember when he told Jesus told his disciples that bro if you follow me you gonna be taken captive they gonna arrest you and they gonna bring you before the court but don't worry about what you gonna say when you get in front of the court because when you get there the Holy Ghost will give you what you need to say ah God I ain't trying to be loud and wrong baby Holy Ghost give me the word so I can be loud and right ah I want you to tell me what it is you got for me to say I want you to tell me what it is you want the people to know I want you to tell me what it is you want the people to understand Lord give me the words so that I can be loud and right hallelujah and so Paul says that he is not ashamed of the gospel and what we immediately come uh, into mind of is boldness and believing. However, what I notice about the word believing or believer is that the word lie is sandwiched in the middle of it. Mm. Can I sit there for a moment? I noticed that in the middle of the word, the believer, there's a word called lie. And we struggle with lies. Ah, oh, God. Isn't it interesting that the word lie is in the middle of your belief? Okay, I'm going to sit here for a moment. I need you to understand that B, B, E is at the beginning and E, R is at the end. And what you need to understand about the prefix B, E, it means to make, to cause, or to sing. Mm -hmm. Ooh, B E means to make, to cause, or to save. Uh, somebody say to make, to cause, or to see. And what this denotes is, is that the B E is affecting or causing something. And so when we move on, the suffix er means that something's performed with emphasis and whatever comes before it is done. For example, 
teacher. They teach. But they don't just teach because they got the information. Having the information is one thing. But giving the information means that you're fulfilling the purpose of the information. Preachers preach. Is that right? When something is fast, but it moves even faster, it's faster. It's emphasized that it's faster. It's harder. It's hotter. Anything with an ER denotes that something is being done in some cases with greater emphasis. And so with B meaning to have an effect on and ER meaning to perform with the lie in the middle between the two of them Believing simply is having a positive effect on the lives that are controlling your life, making sure that the outcome performs what has been set in front of it. In other words, what you got to understand is that when you are a believer, being a believer keeps the lie in its place. Being a believer keeps the lie from becoming too pronounced in your situation. Being a believer keeps the lie under control. Being a believer keeps the lie from ruining your life. Being a believer keeps the lie from wrecking who you are. Being a believer keeps the lie from messing up everything that God wants to do in your life. You've got to be a believer to keep the lie in its place. Lie, get in your place because I believe. Lie, get in your place because God's going to do it. Lie, get in your place because God said it will. When I'm a believer, I make the lie get under my feet. When I'm a believer, I make the lie get under control. Lie, you ain't going to get out today. Lie, you own punishment. Lie, you own restriction. Lie, get in the corner somewhere and face the wall. You can't come out today because my belief is high. My believing is up. My believing is on today. My believing is popping today. Lie, get in your place. I'm a bold-faced believer and I can look a lie in its face and say you a bold-faced lie. I'm coming out of this. You a bold-faced lie. Victory is mine. You a bold-faced lie. I told Satan, get thee behind. You a bold-faced lie because victory is mine. Put the lie in its place. You got to believe your way through some stuff in this season. You ain't going to get through this season unscathed. You ain't going to get through this season without doubt. You ain't going to get through this season without some uh, fear. You're going to have to tell the lie. Lie, you are under control. Lie, put your lie on a leash. Oh, yeah. Lie, get on this leash. Lie, get under my feet. Lie, you can't get out of here today. You're going to sit right where you're supposed to be between the B and the E. Oh, so that I can know that the thing that I'm supposed to be, I'm becoming. And so Paul is in a situation here when he writes Romans and he has to believe. Ask me why. Because the setting of when Romans was written tells us what was on Paul's mind when he wrote Romans 1 and 16. Uh, Scholars suggest that at the time Paul wrote Romans, he's dealing with a triangulation of events that should have killed his ministry. 
He's dealing with a triangulation of events that should have snuffed him out. He's dealing with a triangulation of events, ah, God, that should have made him give up and quit. Because what he's dealing with here is, is that he's on his way making, uh, uh, collecting charitable donations for the poor, oh God, in one space and in another situation while he's out doing the Lord's work, uh, collecting charitable donations for the poor, oh God, he, he's experiencing a brother named Demetrius who's a silversmith who's given him problems with his other brothers and some other brothers in another space. And in the, in the same setting, while while he's dealing with that, he's dealing with a warrant for his arrest. I need you to understand that Paul is in the process of collecting charitable gifts, dealing with confusion caused by Demetrius and facing a court case. Can I give you all that again? He's collecting, dealing with confusion and facing a court case. He's collecting, dealing with confusion and facing a court case. And what I need you to understand is that at the time that he's writing, uh, he's collecting for the poor. And while he's collecting, uh, two of his associates have been taken hostage by a mob led by Demetrius, who is mad because Demetrius is a silversmith and Paul's ministry is causing his business to slow down because now people don't want to buy them idols no more. Mm. Uh, uh, yeah, people don't want to buy the idols. And so now Demetrius is mad and he's holding his homeboys hostage to a Paul's team associates hostage. Oh God, trying to bring them down because he don't want the ministry to go forth. Uh, can I tell y'all something? Uh, the idols got to stop. Mm. Uh, when the idols stop, the devil gets mad. When the idols stop, the devil don't want to see you go forth. When the idols stop the devil try to arrest you when the idols stop the devils try to destroy you and so Paul is dealing with collecting oh God all of these different uh, 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 donations but he's also dealing with his associates being held hostage by Demetrius who's upset because his uh, silver work business is coming down because the idols have begun to fall oh God you've got to understand that while though while he's dealing with that he's also dealing with the religious leaders that he used to be a part of the community he used to run with who's trying to arrest him and bring him to court so he's dealing with collecting confusion and a court case I need you to understand that although he's dealing with all of these things y'all ain't gonna believe this that all three situations are on the forefront of Paul's mind as he put paper to pen and the first thing that he says after he greets the Romans is I ain't ashamed of it I feel that oh God the first thing he says after he greets them is that yeah I'm collecting I'm oh God I'm dealing with confusion and I got a court case but I ain't ashamed of it yeah I'm doing the Lord's work and I got a hater and I got somebody who won't be arrested but I ain't ashamed of it oh God you've got to understand that he says that I ain't ashamed of the gospel of of Jesus Christ and it's interesting that Paul looks at all three situations and attributes them to the gospel you got to understand ladies and gentlemen that the gospel brings out all kinds of situations and this is why you can't worry about your reputation you will look like a saint to some a nuisance to others and an enemy to somebody else all working through the same situation. One group wants to give Paul honor because of the gospel. Another group wants to kill Paul because of the gospel. Another group wants him in jail because of the gospel. But it's all because of the same gospel. And Paul is saying, I 
ain't ashamed of nothing that the gospel has put me through. Whoa! I ain't ashamed of nothing that the gospel has brought me through. Because one group think I'm good. Another group think I'm bad for business. And another group think, oh man, we just need to lock him up. The same gospel has him facing the same three different situations through the same person and his action hasn't changed once. He's taken the same action. He's preached the same message. He's lifted Jesus and Jesus has brought the best out of some people, the hate out of other people, and an irate spirit out of somebody else. You've got to understand that just because it's the gospel don't mean that it's going to change people's mind about you. And some folk going to think you the best thing since sliced bread. Some people going to think you a problem. And other folk going to think, I want to do away with them. But you got to understand that it's the same gospel that's bringing out the attitude that's within them. See, you got to understand that whatever the gospel brings out of you, that's what's in you. So if the gospel brings praise out of you, it's because you're full of praise. But if the gospel brings hate out of you, it's because you're full of hate. But if the gospel brings, I want to lock him up and do something to him out of you, it's because you just got a bad spirit and want to do something to somebody. Same gospel, but three different outcomes because you got to understand that the gospel will have you loved, it will have you hated, and it will have you in a situation where people don't want to be bothered with you at all. But you got to be a bold-faced believer. And so, Paul is bold in his speech because he ain't writing to bashful people. As I briefly alluded to last week, the church at Rome was one of the hottest churches of its day. It was probably one of the fastest growing churches in that region. And what's interesting is, watch this, Paul didn't plant that church. This is why he writing a letter. He ain't even met these people before. But their fame had spread throughout all the land and reached him. And he felt compelled to reach back. Some people have argued whether or not Peter planted it, but there doesn't seem to be enough evidence to support that Peter actually planted the church at Rome. And it has also been stated that possibly somebody like Phoebe, who's carrying this letter, or Priscilla and Aquila, quite possibly, planted the church at Rome, but nobody knows. However, regardless of who established it, catch this, to have the fastest growing and most popular church in that region without a major apostolic voice leading the work required somebody with exceptional boldness. And God told me to tell you that if you want whatever you're doing to grow, you got to stay bold. I'm going to say that again. I don't think y'all caught it. I just said that this was the fastest growing, most popular church in that region. And there wasn't one apostolic leader leading it. Paul wasn't the, wasn't the one who planted it. Peter wasn't the one who planted it. Some unknown folk planted it. They have the fastest growing, most popular church in the region because they had exceptional boldness. And the reason why Paul comes to them in this bold manner is because they are already bold. And one bold person knows the language of a bold person. 
And so God is saying that if whatever you want to, whatever you're doing, whatever you are, are trying to accomplish, if you want it to grow, you've got to stay bold. You can't be timid in this season. You can't be drawn back in this season. You've got to learn how to stay bold and ain't nothing coming out of you if you shy. Ain't nothing coming out of you if you timid. You're going to have to lean into your boldness to accomplish the mandate that the gospel has placed on you. I'm bold face believe it in this season. Mm -hmm. I'm bold faced believing in this season this, this ain't the time to be worried about what's going to happen this, this ain't the time to be worried about my reputation this ain't, this ain't the time to be worried about who talking about me this ain't the time to be worried about who whispering about me this ain't the time to be worried about who confused about me I'm believing boldly I'm believing daringly I'm believing me I'm believing oh God at a level that's going to absolutely shift everything I got these people this didn't even have a name in terms of a, a major apostolic voice leading them but they the fastest growing they the biggest they're moving in a, in a way that's life shifting and changing not even having a Peter not even having a Paul we don't know who planted the church all we know is that they have to be exceptional in their boldness to have a ministry growing like that without having the credentials of being an apostle They ain't going to like your growth, but stay bold. They ain't going to like your advancement, but stay bold. They ain't going to agree with it, but stay bold. And the same gospel that brings you notoriety will bring you accusation. And so you've got to learn how to stay bold. And that's what Paul was trying to get them to understand. That the same gospel that has you on fire, oh God, will bring haters. The same gospel that has you with notoriety will bring finger pointers. The same gospel that has you with aspirations will bring accusations. You've got to learn how to stay bold. And as fast as the church of Rome was growing, we must understand that with massive growth comes massive problems. And one of the problems Rome had was structure for their growth. And you got to understand that although this church was growing, it wasn't centrally located. They met in houses. They met in various places. They met wherever they could meet. And what you have to understand is that as they were growing, they lacked order. The more growth they had, the more disorganized they became. See, this is why I'm trying to get y'all to understand why we should be tight on our organization. Oh, God, I'm going to say it. We should be tighter than tight on our organization because when you at our level, there shouldn't be nothing missing in terms of uh, 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 being on point. You got less to deal with. You, you got less to handle. You got less to face. You got less to do. So the one thing that you do should be the tightest thing that you ever do because there's not as many demands on you. See, y'all want growth, but y'all don't want structure. Y'all want growth, but y'all want structure. Imagine one of these bridges that they building around here, these overpasses, having cars go across it without the right pillars and structure under it. Eventually, it's going to what? So growth without structure leads to a collapse. And what Paul is trying to get them to understand is, you growing, but you ain't organized like you need to. Want to know why it's important? Cancer grows. Infection called swelling, which produces growth. All growth ain't good growth. 
some growth has to be remedied with the right structure in place to make sure that the growth is good. Because growth can grow away from you. I've been looking at my flower bed. I'm looking at my, my rose bushes. And they're getting longer, but ain't no roses on them. I've been thinking, what's wrong with my roses, man? Come to find out. Little rabbit in the neighborhood come eating your plants. But watch this. If I had properly trimmed and allowed the growth to go up properly instead of growing out everywhere, he wouldn't be able to reach the roses to eat them. The growth problem was on me because I didn't properly structure the bush to grow in the right direction. So all growth ain't good growth. If it ain't properly structured, the growth can cause you to not have any fruit or any roses on your bush. Now you got a long, tall bush with no roses because you didn't properly set up the structure for the growth. Catch this. So they have massive growth. And Paul tells them in Romans 12, 14 through 13. In verse, I mean, Romans 12, 4 through 13. And in verse 4, he says, For as we have many members in one body, but all the members so, so not have the, do not have the same function. What he's letting them know is, is that in order for the growth to continue and be healthy, then everybody has to know their role and stay in their place with their gift. Paul goes on to say, he wants the right people in the right place with their gift. Let those who are gifted in the word minister in the word. Let those who are gifted in hospitality minister in hospitality. Let those who are gifted with money handle the money. We don't want people operating in spaces they're not gifted in. Watch this. I've been paying attention to this because I'm a preacher. You realize some of the fastest growing churches ain't growing because the preacher good. There's one particular church, I ain't gonna name it. Got exploding with campuses. And I listen to the pastor, and I'm like, he preaching that and got all these people in there? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Talked to one of my friends about it, and he told me the material. I said, that's what he doing? He got who packed out? He doing fill in the blank ministry? And the house is packed? It ain't, they ain't packed because of the word. They packed because of the great administration. See, you could be a great administrator and a poor communicator. But because your administration is good, folk come. Okay, have I gone too far? Watch this. Their growth, he wants you to understand that another problem is they have momentum, but if there's one thing that ruins momentum, it's thinking that we're the reason for it. I'm going to say that again. They got momentum. But if there's one thing that ruins momentum, it's thinking that you're the reason for the momentum. Paul says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, 
For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. Catch this. Their growth was not because they were so awesome. Their growth was due to the gospel, which is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. And can I tell you something and still be your friend? Sometimes the lie we buy into is believing that we're the reason for something happening. The biggest lie we buy into is believing that we're the reason something's happening. If I don't give, I can take the whole church down. Try it. And see if God don't send somebody with more money than you. If I don't Show up. There ain't nothing gonna get down to get done. Let's see. You got to understand that God is the reason for you being blessed. God is the reason for you being safe. God is the reason for you to have the health you got. God is the reason for you to have the wealth you got. God is the reason for you to be able to get up out of the bed and be in your right mind. You ain't the reason, oh God, and you ain't the reason why the church is going. You ain't the reason why we able to stand. Oh God, we appreciate you and we thank you and we're glad you are part of it, but don't think that just because you don't do it, it won't don't get done. God will send somebody more bold than you. God will send somebody with more skills than you. God will send somebody with more help than you. God will send somebody with more ability. So humble yourself and be thankful that you are part of the body instead of thinking that you the cat's meow and the dog bow wow. Think it is you will kill your momentum. Paul said it's the power of God unto salvation. Ain't nobody coming in because of you. I'm just telling the truth. It humbles you when you understand that if it ain't for God, I wouldn't be here. If it wasn't for God, we wouldn't be able to stay. I ain't going to take his place. I can't do nothing with it. Watch this. Y'all realize that God's math is better than yours? I was listening to Dr. Myron Golden. He said something that blew me away. He says, the scripture says, one can send a thousand to flight, but two can send 10,000 to flight. He said he was confused. Because if one can send a thousand, then shouldn't the other one only be able to do a thousand? How in the world do you go from one doing a thousand to do two doing 10,000? He said, it's God's math. And he broke it down this way. He said, it's better to have 50% of God's math than 100% of yours. Ask me why. Because 100% will produce 1,000. But if two can produce 10,000, 50% produces 5,000. So it's better to have 50% of God than 100% of yourself. And many of us have been relying on 100% of self and losing because we're trying to figure out how are two people producing more at 50% than I am at 100%. It's because one can send a thousand but two can send 10,000 because God's mouth don't miss. I told the Lord today 
Uh, I've been telling them all week. I didn't even know I was going to talk about this. I've been telling them all week, Lord, give me 10% of your favor. I only want my 100% ain't jacked. My 100% is trash. Lord, give me 10% of your favor and I'll turn, I, I can change the world. Give me 10% of what you're able to do and I'll change the world. I don't even need all of it. Lord, just give me 10%. You asked me for 10%, I gave it to you. Now give me a 10%. But Lord, if you want to put 100 on me, I'll take the 100. Oh God. But whatever you want to do, Father, lead me in the direction that you want to lead me to. Lead me to the rock. That is higher than I. Oh, you have been a shelter for me. All right. Give me 10%, Lord, I'm going to do it. But watch this. Another thing that hurt your momentum is division. The gospel is just not the power of God unto salvation, but it's to everyone who believe. Paul says the Jew first, but also the Greek. Paul helps us to understand that nothing kills momentum like division. When Paul says that salvation is for everyone, the Jew first and also the Greek, he ain't ranking them. He humbling them. Y'all thought he was ranking. He humbling them. Watch this. They should be humbled because the Jews were first to hear the good news but rejected it. And the mere fact that they rejected it should humble the Jews that accepted it. And although the Greeks are Gentiles, we're receptive, it should humble us that we got, got it last. So what we have to understand is, is that either way, neither party has a monopoly on the good news. So let us put our prejudices aside. Let us put our pride aside. Let us put our territorial beliefs aside and just embrace the idea that salvation is for everybody who believes. I said believe. Do you realize that there's something called progressive sanctification? What that means is, is that we're, we're constantly going through the process of progressing towards being all that God called us to be. But we got to start at the conception of our belief. So the moment that you believe Jesus is the son of God and that he died for your sins and that he rose from the grave with all power, you saved. Now, as we begin to grow in our faith, we begin to grow in our gifting. And as we begin to operate in our gifting, we begin to grow in our rewards. But once you give your life to the Lord and believe in him, you sealed. But the lie will tell you that you can fall from grace. Can't fall from grace. Grace is the ultimate safety net. Grace is like the dude on the high wire, walking across the high wire, lose his balance and fall. He don't just plummet. He hit the net and bounce up again. Grace is a safety net to help you get your balance again. I ain't doing a whole lot of hard preaching today. Y'all leave me alone. Y'all want me to preach till I sweat out my clothes every week. Y'all gonna pay for my 
cleaner, dry cleaning deal. One day. Okay, thank you. I appreciate it. I'll, I'll, I'll send it to you. And so we have to get past our prejudices to fully understand the gospel. Because this church wasn't just a church with Jews or a church with Gentiles, like Philippians was mostly Gentile. This church had a balance of different types of culture, well, of two cultures, Gentile and Jew, and they had to learn how to work together because in order for their momentum to continue, they had to put their differences aside. What would the church look like if we put our differences aside? I don't want to argue with you today. I want to love you. My pastor used to say, he used to end the service, I love you. There ain't nothing you could do about it. He used to make people say it. I don't want to argue, man. Let's get along. Let's find out ways to, to change the world. Let's find out ways to do something impactful. Let's find out ways to do something different. Let's find out ways to make a difference and an impact. I'm putting my differences aside. I'm humbled by the fact that God called me. I'm humbled by the fact that I got a microphone in my hand right now. Thirteen years ago, I quit the ministry. Well, now, 14 years ago. Quit the ministry. I ain't even go to church for three years. See, y'all don't want to hear this. Can I be real? I'm a bold-faced believer. And in order to be a bold-faced believer, I got to put the lie in its place. And the lie has been we don't tell everything. No. I got to tell the truth. I ain't even want to go to church for three years straight. I ain't go to church. Nobody's church. I was done with it. Tired of it. Tired of the clicks. Tired of the fakes. Tired of the snakes. Tired of all of it. I sat home for three years straight. I ain't touching no microphone. People will invite me to come speak. I ain't speaking because I ain't, I don't need to be speaking. I need to be sitting down somewhere. Finally, I started out teaching twice a week, twice a month at a men's halfway house. Wasn't no cameras, wasn't no microphone. Half time, the brothers act like they didn't know what I was talking about. But I was faithful to it for two years. Then the Lord transitioned me to be away for a while, and I came back and got reacclimated little by little in ministry, little by little, little by little. But I said that to say this that you just don't know what God is going to do through you and around you and because of what I went through makes me stronger today. We quit but sometimes you need to quit. <laughs> sometimes you need to quit so that you can reset and get back at it again. And that's what I went through. Give me some music. Sugar calling me. Tell me I have been up too long. And so we have to have life application. Here it is. God wants us to take something from Paul and what he says in Romans 1 and 16. And if anyone had to believe boldly, it's Paul. And the reason why Paul got to believe <clears throat> boldly is because Paul has a history. 
He was the persecutor of the church. He was the one who stood there while the other Pharisees laid their coats at his feet as he gave the order to stone Stephen. Paul was responsible for killing one of the greatest evangelists we ever saw. So he got this on his conscience. And one day he got a letter from the high priest in Jerusalem to go and raid the synagogues throughout the region and arrest Christians and bring them back for trial. And when he was on his way to Damascus, he had an encounter with Jesus, knocked him off his horse. A light appeared. Jesus began to speak. All the brothers around him was blinded by the light. And they couldn't even hear it. But they knew something had happened. And they got Paul up, put him on his horse, and he went on. And there was another brother that God sent to prophesy to him. Because Paul was temporary, temporarily blind, restored his sight. And now he went from being the persecutor of the church to a crusader for the church. But the church don't trust him because of his past. His old partners don't trust him because he like, they like, you were once with us. Now you talking about the thing that we were really killing and trying to destroy. And so Paul had to come up with his own belief theology because you got to remember he didn't walk with Jesus like the other apostles. He received the revelation a different way and in order to dispel the lie that has been told to try to get you to believe that what God has done for you isn't real Paul gives us lessons throughout his different ministry journeys on how to dispel those lies. Because the enemy will try to get you to believe that you're not loved, but the truth is God loves unconditionally. Romans 8, 38 through 39 says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither present nor nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in creation will be able to separate us from the love of God. The enemy will try to get you to believe that you're not good enough, but the truth is God has given you the advantage in every good work. Ephesians 2 and 10, Paul says, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us. The enemy will try to get you to believe that you are defined by your past. But Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5 and 17, therefore if anyone be in Christ, they are a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things are now new. The enemy will try to get you to believe that you are powerless against sin. But Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 and 57, but thanks be unto God who causes us to triumph in his name. In Christ Jesus. So reflecting. On Paul. And how far he had to come. And all he had to forget to believe. No wonder he can say confidently. I am not ashamed. Of the gospel. Of Jesus Christ. For it's the power of God unto salvation to the Jew first and also the Greek. 
some things have got to lead you to a point where the, although Paul should be ashamed of his past, he's not ashamed of his transformation. Yeah, I did it. But I'm in Christ now. Yeah, I said it. But I know Jesus now. Yeah, I was there with them. But I'm here with him now. When you truly become unashamed, it ain't because of what you did. It's because of what he's done. He's done so much for me. I cannot tell it all. I cannot tell it all. I cannot tell it all. He has done so much for me. I cannot tell it all. He has taken my sins away. Father, we